Welcome to Walk in the Park. My name's Tony Ingram. This is February 13th, episode 38. And today we are going to go to Cayuga Lake. And I was out there this morning, actually. Here's a picture of Cayuga Lake this morning. And it's got a little bit of ice in it. Uh, we'll talk about that later when we get towards the end of the show. But um, well, the question comes up. Cayuga Lake is the... Um, longest of the Finger Lakes and the second deepest. The deepest actually is Seneca Lake, which is slightly shorter than Cayuga Lake. But in any case, it's over 400 feet deep, and that's a lot of water to cool off. So the question is, does Cayuga Lake ever freeze over? Well, yes, indeed, it does, or at least it has. We don't know if it'll freeze over again, but it has a number of times in history. So what we're going to do is actually go back a couple of years and look at a, uh, a substantial segment of a show I did, an episode I did of a program I called Cayuga Lake Heritage. It was a former series I did here on Pegasus. So uh, let's uh, go take a look at that here. I'm going to go over to this uh, picture again I took this morning and we'll, we'll bring up that uh, segment here. Just a minute. And disappear. And we'll all be looking forward to that, I guess. But um, so, uh, of course, uh, Teganic Falls, Teganic Creek drains into Cayuga Lake. And so does, uh, does Cayuga Lake ever freeze? The waterfall nearly freezes. But does Cayuga Lake ever freeze? The lake is really, really long. This is an aerial view, by the way, by my friend Bill Hecht, who likes to get up in an airplane every once in a while and fly around and take pictures of the landscape. And has given us... He shares that with everybody, and it's a, a fantastic resource. So uh, he posts them on the web, and and uh, and I downloaded this. So this is about where King Ferry is up in Cayuga County. I think that's probably Sheldrake Point on the right hand side, looking south towards Ithaca. But it's not frozen. Now, this is actually a picture taken in early during the winter in which it was taken. I don't think there was much ice on the lake, but uh, typically we get to let's say something like this. This was two years ago at the south end of Cayuga Lake, down at, uh, well, this was actually coming down Route 13, looking uh, across the lake, and on the left would be uh, Stewart Park, and on the right, of course, would be the beginning of the lake, and West Hill across there. I, you can see the guardrail down there. I pulled over, ran out, and took this picture, and jumped back in the car, because you're not supposed to stop there. But I had to get this shot. And so, so you can see the lake has frozen over to the, um, Oh, maybe half a mile or so. I don't know how far that is. I, I remember years ago it freezing much more and snow would fall on it. And I could ski for a mile or two down the lake, cross-country skis years ago. But um, uh, Cuga Lake doesn't get a whole lot more ice than this uh, these days. So, well, back in the really old days, Cuga Lake was made by ice. Now, this use this picture before. It says, it's a great one. It's a painting by William Dilger, who um, uh, did this in 1952. And this is a uh, depiction of mastodons roaming across the scene on South Hill, looking north to Cuga Lake. And if you look up in the top center of the picture, you can see a white area. That is a plug of ice, a glacier. So Cuga Lake, as most of us know, one way or the other, was, was created by glaciers during the Ice Age, an ancient river valley that was reamed out by the passage of glaciers many times. And here we'll take a look at a, a glacier here in Norway that in the bottom of the picture is actually a lake with icebergs in it. And this is a huge mass of glacier in central Norway. Central Norway is an ice cap and kind of like Greenland, but not quite that big. But in any case, the same idea, thousands of feet thick. And the glacier spreads down in the valleys heading towards the sea. And of course, that's where you get all your fjords in Norway were drowned glacial valleys after the sea level rose at the end of the Ice Age from the melting of all the ice back into the ocean. Um, so let's go to another image here of Cayuga Lake. Now we're looking north. You can see on the left shore there. This, this is from a commercial air flight I took many years ago back when, when the, uh, the local airlines used to fly through, the U.S. Airways used to go through Pittsburgh, so you'd always fly west. And it was great to uh, get that uh, picture. But um, so anyway, 
Cayuga Lake is, uh, well, you can see on the left-hand side there, I'm sorry, is, is a peninsula sticking up. That's Taganic Point. And then in the, right in the center of the picture, you can see this white thing. That's the plume of steam coming off the AES Cayuga electric power generating station that takes coal from West Virginia. Mountaintop Mines is brought up there and burned to make our electricity and to put global warming gases into the atmosphere. But that's another story. In any case, uh, what I really want to talk about is the cooling of the lake. And uh, Cayuga Lake is what is known as a monomictic lake. What the heck is that? Well, I took a course in, in uh, basically lake science years ago, limnology, and a monomictic lake means a lake that mixes just once. Mono is Greek for one, mictic, I guess, is Greek for mix. In any case, uh, what that means is that it doesn't usually freeze over. Now, if a lake freezes over, well, it's getting complicated here. If a lake freezes over, then the wind cannot mix the lake in the wintertime. And when the, when the ice melts in the spring, then the wind can mix all the water in the lake. And then in the summer, when the water warms up, you get a warm layer of uh, water that won't mix with the cold water before. And that below, I'm sorry. And that's what happens at Cayuga Lake. When it warms up in the spring, by summer, the lake is said to be stratified and it doesn't mix uh, the warm water above with the cold water deep below. And that's what the Cornell Lake Source Cooling system uh, takes advantage of is that cold water down below to bring it up to cool the campus water. Um, so, so in a um, lake that freezes over, you get this mixing time in the spring when the wind mixes the uh, water after the ice is melted. And then the, uh, in the fall, the lake starts to mix again as it cools off. You no longer have that stratification. And you get another period of mixing. And then it freezes over and there's no mixing because the wind can't mix the water in the lake. So that's called a diamictic lake. Well, we have a monomictic lake because in the fall, when the lake cools off, there's no more stratification. It will just turn over and mix all winter long. So uh, that's what we get. And uh, the water, uh, uh, well, we'll get into later just what happens uh, about that. All right. Let's see what else we got here. So here's another view down the lake to the north. Now, I say down the lake. No, wait a minute. I'm looking... Oh, gee, which way am I looking here? Oh, maybe I'm looking back towards Ithaca here. That might be here. I'm a little uh, disoriented by my own photograph, Bill Hecht's photograph. Um, but most of the lake remains ice-free. But s the, most of the other Finger Lakes, with the exceptions of uh, Seneca Lake, Seneca Lake's like Cayuga Lake, it's a big lake, and it doesn't generally freeze over. But let's look at the, where do we get here? There we go. Look at that. Now, that's not my picture. I got this off the internet. And uh, the, um, the, this is a picture of Cuca Lake, probably in the early morning. And the sun is glinting off the ice in the lake. Most of these smaller finger lakes, if you have a normally cold winter, will freeze over. But generally not Cuyuga Lake and Seneca Lake. All right here. So we're just going to look at some spots around the lake in the wintertime. Now, this is Myers Point, and the point is sticks out in the lake. This is in the in town of Lansing, just the northern part of the um, county. And on the left-hand side of the point, you can see Salmon Creek coming out into the lake. And then if you can sort of follow up to the upper left of the picture, that's actually the Salmon Creek Valley. And you notice in Salmon Creek there, there's ice because it's shallow there. But when you get out in the lake, you haven't got ice yet, although it's fairly shallow around um, Myers Point. Okay. Now I'll take a look at Teganic Point here. This is another Bill Hecht aerial here. I get some spectacular shots of Teganic Gorge and Point. Teganic Point is uh, where the glaciers sheared off the side of the valley and uh, left the trough of Cayuga Lake, and then the creek established itself on the hillside and eroded out the gorge over time. And uh, that's how we get our gorges here. This is looking straight up the gorge. Our waterfalls form on the sides of the glacially uh, excavated, steepened valley side of the lake. And then they've eroded back into the shales of the hillside here. So uh, although this isn't uh, showing you ice, it's showing you the effects of ice, or actually the indirect effects of ice. This is 
the um, the gorges and waterfalls are are uh, resulted from a, uh, the glaciers setting the stage. Oh, here's another one here. Ah, coming around to the west, looking east over the canyon, and as it winds its way to Cayuga Lake, and notice the point sticks right out at the end of the gorge, and what that point is, what is Taganic Creek has carried the eroded rock and soil into Cayuga Lake over thousands of years, and that's where it all went. And the floods that roar through Taganic in the spring and so forth will carry the earth out there and then dump it into the lake. And just off the point of the, um, uh, just off a Taganic point out in the lake there, the lake is as deep as the gorge is here. So it takes a long time for it to, to move over and to, to extend out into the lake. But if you go down to the south end of the lake again, this was last winter about a year ago and you can see that uh, again we had some freezing I think we didn't get too much freezing at the south end of the lake for periods of time and then it would thaw we got a little and there um, so the reason the south end of the lake freezes is because it's shallow there for a mile or so north of Stewart Park on the Cayuga Inlet the water is only about 10 feet deep so in the shallow portions the water is able to cool off enough and it doesn't mix with the general uh, deep water of the lake, uh, which would keep it from, perhaps keep it from freezing. And so you get some ice down at the, the south end of the lake. Uh, let's see what do we got next here to show you. Oh yeah, this is uh, Cayuga Inlet. And uh, this is actually at the farmer's market in December. So obviously boating season is over and uh, will be a while before they start. If you go out there now, you'll see some standing water on the ice in Cayuga Inlet from the, the rain and the thaw and so forth, and that'll break up eventually. But one of the things that, that happens is the state lets down the lake in the fall, lets it down through maybe more than three feet. Uh, the other end, there's, there are control gates that control the level of Cayuga Lake's water as it empties into the, the, uh, the Seneca River and the Erie Canal and uh, to regulate the winter level of the lake for a couple of reasons. To bring the water down so that when you do get ice along the shore, it doesn't damage people's docks. But uh, maybe even more important is that we get sometimes tremendous runoff from snow melt and uh, spring rains in uh, March and April um, that uh, will pump huge amounts of water into the watershed which the outlet of the lake can't accommodate. So the lake level's been dropped. Of course, in Cayuga Inlet, if you were trying to, even if there were not ice here, if you were trying to bring a boat in, you would find that you'd only have maybe you know, three or four feet of water at best, and maybe less than that in some spots. So uh, the marinas have to scramble to get their boats out of the water before they end up in the mud and uh, as they let the water down in Cayuga Inlet. And all other marinas around the lake, the whole lake is let down a few feet. But the northern end of the lake is a um, different story. Now, we're looking over what's called Farley's Point, which is south of the town of Union Springs on the east shore of the lake. And you can see that bay there is, is um, frozen over largely. And then on the upper part of the picture, you can see that the ice continues for quite a, quite a distance, maybe 8 or 10 miles from there. Because the north end of the lake, the uh, northernmost eight miles maybe, is 10 feet deep or less in most places. And that's uh, pretty shallow. And so the lake can cool off. There's not a lot of deep water that will mix, that mictic thing, the mixing of the deeper water, which will warm it up. Interesting thing, in the middle of the winter, out in the deep portions of the lake, the um, Actually, warmer water can be, slightly warmer water can be down in the bottom or down lower in the depths of the lake. And the surface of the lake might be near freezing, but you go down 50 feet in your water, that's uh, maybe 39 degrees or something. And it turns out that that's the temperature at which, 39, 40 degrees or 4 degrees centigrade is the temperature at which water is its densest. The molecules are closest together as water cools off and it becomes its densest because it, once it starts to get towards freezing, it starts, the molecules start to line up in a crystal pattern and it actually decreases the density of the water. So the colder water 
uh, may actually go to the top, and you may, and that's that's why you get the ice on the surface. The whole world would be different. We probably wouldn't have any life on this planet if uh, the opposite were true. If ice were heavier than liquid water and sunk to the bottom, then all of these lake basins and ocean basins would fill up with ice permanently, and we'd have an ice planet like you know out there in Pluto or wherever it is. And um, fortunately, we we don't have to. Uh, Think about that. So I'm going to show you another shot here of looking north. This is looking over the village of Union Springs across the lake. You can see that boundary of the frozen lake surface with the open water. And then right to the slightly upper left, you see this dot out in the ice. That is Frontenac Island. That's the only island in Cayuga Lake and one of the few islands at all in the Finger Lakes. And uh, that's a uh, that's out there, held frozen in the lake there. There's a lot of interesting things to say about Frontenac Island as it was an archeological site and there were um, people living there 4,000 years ago that uh, lived on that island and fished on Cayuga Lake. Let's see what we have coming up next here. Ah, well, if you're up at the north end of the lake, maybe you like to go out ice fishing. So here's a, a couple of guys with uh, mo um, snowmobiles and they're hauling a sled with their ice fishing equipment and because uh, the water is shallow there and they can go out on the ice and and uh, cut holes in the ice and maybe even set up a little shack and warming hut and so forth and catch fish maybe northern pike or uh, you know some of the warmer water fish perch yellow perch maybe even some bass well I guess that's not bass season is it but um, uh, and in some places they might even catch a trout uh, actually, in some of the other Finger Lakes that freeze over with deeper water, you can get some of the... Although the trout and the salmon, they, they move around all you know, when the water is pretty much equal temperature. They move all around the lake, so who knows, maybe catch a trout there. But I don't know much about ice fishing. I watch people do it and scratch my head and walk away. But, but uh, it is very pop popular at the north end of Cayuga Lake. And I'm sure that I didn't get up there this, this season to see, but uh, uh, I'm sure that's been going on. And of course, it's always an issue how thick the ice is and whether it's it's uh, safe or not. And um, well, I'm gonna read you a couple of stories now. Let's see, how do fish survive the freezing water? This is a little bit of an article in uh, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network newsletter from uh, I don't know a few years ago. Fish are well adapted to surviving the winter underwater. Being cold-blooded, their body temperature is equivalent to that of the water, which is sometimes freezing. In order to stay alive at low temperatures, their metabolism slows down, growth ceases, and they are basically on a maintenance diet. However, the degree, however, the degree to which their systems and activities slows down varies considerably from species to species. Cold water species like trout and salmon remain relatively active frequenting the deep cold reaches of the lake. Small trout feed heavily on mysis, mysis, a shrimp-like creature that lives offshore. Mysis move up and down in the water column in response to sunlight. In order to feed, the small trout actively follow their movement. Large trout enhance their diet and activity by feeding on smaller fish, including alewives and smelt. Warm water fish like pickerel, pike, sunfish, and bass have different strategies for enduring the winter, enduring the winter water Many stay in shallow, weedy areas and reduce their activity levels. Even with reduced energy, large pickerel will ambush any fish they can swallow, including trout. However, neither the cold nor warm water predators can resist bait drop through the ice, and both fall prey to ice fishers even at the coldest temperatures. So that's why they're out there. Let's see what else we got coming up here image-wise. Ooh, you know, so has Cayuga Lake ever frozen end to end? Hmm, indeed it has. In fact, it's frozen end to end a number of times in history. And I have some uh, data here that uh, I'm going to read. This is actually a view of the village of Cayuga. So up in that area where there was typically freezes from out on the lake from, this is an old picture, could be 100 years old. Uh, once again, thanks to Bill Hecht, I believe, on this in any case. Um, so I got an assemblage of records of when the lake has frozen. So I'm going to 
bring myself back up to the uh, here we go hi that's me I'm still here not just a disembodied voice so um, I've got some uh, some uh, statistics here from uh, Nelson Nelson Hairstart who is a uh, Hairston Jr who is a um, um, limnologist, a, an environmental scientist at Cornell. In fact, he's the chair of the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Bi Biology, Cornell. And he's come out on the floating classroom on the MV handle out on Cuga Lake that goes out of uh, the farmer's market in Cuga Inlet. And uh, there are eco cruises all through the season on, that are supported by Grant and so forth like that. So, it's, um, so I went out with him once. We had a discussion following the, um, uh, the, the cruise about when has the lake last frozen? And I was saying the last time it really froze solid, well, not solid, but froze the entire surface end to end that you could say, you know, with confidence was 1912, 99 years ago. This being uh, 2011. Um, but there's a number of times that it seems to have frozen since then. But I'm going to go down the list of years that it, people have said the lake has frozen end to end. 1796, 1816, 1818, 1836, 1856, 1875, 1884, and maybe 1885, 1904, 1912, 1918, 1934, or maybe 1936, 1948, 1962, and 1969, and almost in 1994. And I remember that it flo the it froze all the way to uh, Myers Point from Ithaca. And it was uh, temporary, just a few days, and um, uh, not very thick ice. But uh, so the average or mean uh, interval between year of years between complete freezeovers is 14, 14.1. 14 so about every 15 years. But it's been 31 years since Cayuga Lake. Anybody has said, yep, Cuga Lake is frozen in, and I was working at Tagantic Falls State Park. Just started there in 1979, and I started there in January, and the lake is said to have frozen in, in February, I think. And I said, well, maybe it froze up to Tagantic, but the lake, of course, was probably just, just for a short period, so you didn't get snow on the ice, so it was probably clear ice, and maybe it did. Maybe it did. There seemed to be some discussion about that. But uh, in any case, um, the, uh, the lake has, uh, in 1912, was the big one. And um, I have a few images of that that uh, people have described. This is a, well, this is an ice boat. This is actually on Seneca Lake. But uh, a lot has been written about uh, uh, that particular 1912 freeze over. Here's a... I'll start reading a little bit from an article by Barbara Bell. I think this was probably in the Ethica Journal. She used to, uh, she had a uh, column called Glance Backward, and she was a, she's a local historian, and she's been the Schuyler County historian for many years now, but used to write for the Ithaca Journal. Cayuga and Seneca Lakes froze from end to end in January of 1912. Skaters traveled the whole length of the lakes. There were soft spots, rough areas, and barely visible cracks and holes. But sledding, ice boating, and other sports were widely enjoyed and contests were organized. Chairs were mounted on sleds and skaters pushed youngsters and the, el and the elderly across icy expanses. Horse rigs towed riders across the ice and in at least one case, an auto was tested on the slick surface. See if I have that picture here. Oh yeah, here's one. Here's an automobile, 1912, a Maxwell. I've never even heard of a Maxwell, but there's a Maxwell out on Cayuga Lake. Um, let's see. The Maxwell, there it is. It's top brazenly open, top brazenly open. It appeared on Seneca Lake near Valois with chains on the rear tires and bearskin rug for the comfort of those brave enough to tour the ice. Okay, so there's a little bit. Uh, three Ithaca friends who skated the length of Cayuga Lake in 1912. Uh, they, they started out a strong wind from the south, boosted their speed. I'm not going to give you their names. Crisscrossing from Kidder's Landing to King Ferry, they found open water near the middle of the lake, but some previous adventure had bridged the opening with an adequate board. Close to shore, they found the ice soft and hazardous or rough and cracked. The trio stayed away from the shore and, and, and as an extra safety feature, proceeded in single file, staying several feet apart. 
the burned wreckage of the steamship Frontenac was still partially submerged off Farley's Point, which we saw frozen in in that earlier picture, and the Ithacans skirted her. Arriving at Cayuga, they found a large gathering of sleighs, sleds, and cutters. The men, as they began to re the return trip, found the wind chill factor most forbidding and stopped at Aurora to spend the night. Come morning, they boarded the train and rode in comparative comfort for the balance of the trip home. Their arrival in Ithaca caused quite a stir, for many believed them dead. Word had reached Ithaca that three young men had broken through the ice and, and had been lost, but no one knew exactly who they were or where. Ultimately, the rumors proved only too true. Two Cornell students had broken through near King Ferry and drowned. A third skater with them, Rodney Newman, a close friend of Bailey's, one of the uh, other uh, skaters, hoisted himself from the chill waters and was saved. So um, that was 1912, and uh, that was the last time that you really had some uh, uh, really solid freezing that you get these kind of stories from. But you know, maybe uh, some of the later ones were also substantial. I just don't have, nobody seemed to have written about them. So what I'm showing here is the final picture I'm going to show you. This is of cutting ice, ice cutting industry. Used to be an ice cutting industry on all the lakes and ponds because uh, in the old days, we didn't have refrigerators. It wasn't until uh, mid 20th century that people had refrigerators and up until the 1930s or so, uh, there was a big ice industry on Cayuga Lake. So this is an image of, actually this is obviously on Valois, this is on Seneca Lake, but uh, the same sort of thing was on Cayuga Lake. Okay, well that's all we Well, so Cayuga Lake has not frozen on the surface end to end at least since 1979. Now that's a long time if the average uh, or mean uh, interval is about 14 or 15 years. So why is that? Well, the uh, it re what re is required for the lake to freeze over is a period of maybe two weeks or so of really bitter cold weather below zero uh, and very little wind, which is often accompanies very bitter temperatures like that. The, uh, we haven't had that kind of weather uh, very much in many, many years. And uh, the kind of thing we get now is uh, more like what you see in the pictures that I took this morning is uh, you get some ice forming and then you get a thaw and this uh, this actually represents uh, chunks of ice that have been washed down the creeks during a thaw and now they're re-aggregating out in the lake and creating rafts. This is taken from East Shore Park along East Shore Drive. So um, we're not having that bitter cold weather and uh, so why is that? Uh, well we all know about global warming and here is some uh, information about global warming and the Northeast U.S. Uh, this is from the United States Global Change Research Program. Northeast annual average temperature has increased by 2 degrees Fahrenheit since 1970, with winter temperatures rising twice this much. Warming has resulted in many other climate-related changes, including more frequent very hot days, a longer growing season, an increase in heavy downpours, less winter precipitation falling as snow and more as rain, Reduced snowpack, earlier breakup of winter ice on lakes and rivers, earlier spring snow melt resulting in earlier peak river flows. So uh, will we see Cayuga Lake freeze over again? I don't know, maybe, but uh, we're in a new century now with uh, new realities and challenges to face. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for joining me, and uh, we'll see you again next week.